Are there any questions? I put the second assignment up last night. Uh, I'll go through the first assignment very quickly. I think most of you did well from the remarks that look at. But there are some aspects of MATLAB that I would like to uh, expose you to coming from this assignment. What happens to other people? And if you have any questions on the marking itself, you should see the TA. He's a graduate student, uh, you or me. I'll put the contact information on the web if you need to contact him. Okay, the only point I wanted to make and uh, the preliminary part of the first assignment is about the nonlinearity. Okay. So there are two equations and uh, identifying independent and dependent variables, they are all okay. Uh, T is the independent variable and height and temperature are the dependent variables in these two equations. Everything else is a parameter in the sense these are numbers that are given to you. Now the answer to the second question, is it linear or nonlinear, is a bit tricky. Okay, so um, if you look at both the equations, we have identified the unknowns as height and temperature, H and T. Okay. So in the second equation, you will find that there is a product of uh, H and DT, DT. That makes it a nonlinear problem. Product of unknowns, or e to the power, or square cube, cube uh, square root, whatever it is, it makes it nonlinear. So, in general, this problem would be considered a nonlinear problem because of the term that I have identified. But under a special circumstance, when the inlet flow rate and uh, the outlet flow rate are the same, okay, then the tank has reached the steady state height. Then h dt is zero, in which case h becomes a constant. And if h becomes a constant, then this becomes a linear problem. So only under that limit of steady state level in the tank, you'll get uh, a linear differential equation for temperature. When you put up the temperature, it can change, but you're not furthering the flow rate. Okay. So, uh, but if f is a function the square root of h, then it will always be a nonlinear problem. Okay. And uh, the rest of all is fairly easy. Uh, I have posted the solution also. But I wanted to go to what to submit in future in terms of uh, MATLAB session. Okay. So here is a sample. You can use this assignment as a sample when you're submitting. I don't want really long outputs from MATLAB, but the MATLAB programs or scripts that you have written and an interaction. In this case, I've captured it basically as a driver program. Okay. So what you see here is uh, whenever you see a person sign like this, it means it is a comment. MATLAB simply ignores that line. On a command line, you can put person and type anything. You just ignore that. It's a way of commenting what you are doing. Okay. So here I'm saying it's assignment one, part six A. And options, you already know what it does. It sets the option for the ODE integrator. Okay. And the next line is ODE 4.5, the name of the function. This also, you know, we have already seen 
what it is. And these are the initial conditions for the height and the temperature. Okay. And the output that comes from OD45, I'm saving it in the variable called Tx, T comma x. Okay. So x is going to be a matrix with two columns. The first column will be the height. The second column will be the temperature. So that pattern depends on the pattern that you see here. Okay. So here, this is the first variable is for the height. The second variable is for the temperature. It's going to return in the same way. Okay. And uh, the next one is something that I have not seen. And uh, this is how to plot several graphs on the same sheet. Most of you, what you did, you just plotted the t comma x. So it plots both height and temperature on the same graph. Now, height is in the range of 0 to 1. Temperature could be in the range of 0 to 100. So one of the graphs really comes to this question. You don't see the details of the graph. Okay? So if you want to see the full details, then you can plot two graphs at a time. I'm going to show this uh, in MATLAB, but all MATLAB methods are checked out. So I'm not able to start MATLAB here. Let's try. Okay. Yeah. The maximum number of users reached. LSU yeah, has only about 40 licenses and things in the whole engineering. So there are 40 students who are using MATLAB right now. Has that ever happened to you in the lab when you're using? If it does, they need to tell the people so that they increase, they buy more licenses. Okay. So today, it looks like I cannot use my lab to illustrate anything. Yeah. Uh, you can. This command, sub, uh, this is one way of doing it. Basically, what you're going to do here is on a sheet of paper, so this is your sheet of paper, you're going to produce two graphs. One below the other. Okay. So subplot two comma one says I want two plots, but I want them in uh, two rows. Okay. And if I had, unfortunately, I cannot show this, but I'm just going to write it. Subplot one comma two. What that will do is it will put two plots again, but in two columns, side by side. So this will produce a graph like this, another graph like that. Two scales on two sides. Good. <laughs> I didn't know that. I know if I put it on that graph. But that's what you need to do. Just explore and typically at the bottom of a health command for any function, it will give you other related functions. That's how I learned gradually about other things. Okay, what is it called? Plot y, y? Okay. So this is what I did was to plot two separate graphs on the same sheet. And the other feature that I used, which uh, I want to see whether you can explain to me what I've done here. On this this part, remember the problem the mass, height, and temperature for the previous part was the input to the next part of the simulation when we change something, or a temperature or whatever. So what is it doing as a temperature? Well, what it could possibly be doing? Yes. That's what you want, right? So that's what it does. Pulls in the last two numbers from the array of uh, x. Really, going again. <laughs> 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 uh, okay. So the command length simply returns. So this is the in, inner part of the command the length. It takes an argument x and returns the size of that. Okay, so it will return how many rows are there in that particular uh, variable x. Okay, so that row becomes the argument for x. So when you say x, some number, this number could be 79, comma colon. Okay, that's going to pick the 79th row and all the elements in that row. Okay, but I don't know how many are going to be there because 
it depends on how many steps the previous part took the integrating from 0 to 10. So that I can interrogate by simply saying, what is the length of x? How many rows do you have? And use that, automatically substitute that here, and then it will pick up the last value. Okay. So this is a trick. There are a lot of little tricks like this. If you learn about new tricks, please do tell me. Um, and explore on your own. So other than that, there is really nothing. So it's basically, this is called a script file. The difference between a script file and a function file is, function file will have input arguments and output arguments, and it will always have the keyword function. Okay? Whereas a script file is anything that you would normally enter from a command line in MATLAB in an interactive section. You can put it into a file and just enter the name of the file to execute all the commands in that file. So if you create, for example, all the variables in the workspace, T and X, everything will be created automatically. Whereas this, so this will be called a script file. And uh, at the end of it, I document each one of those functions. Okay. So this is the function for the first part of it, A. So this one has the keyword function, an output, an input, and a name to the function. And I highlighted in each case one of the things that I'm changing as well to make it easy for the grader to follow what you're doing. So feel free to put a lot of comments, explain. For example, the same line, after a semicolon, if you put percent, that's a comment. That's a comment that says what are the units that I'm using. Okay. That will help you, you yourself later on if you want to look at the program and you've forgotten what you did before. Okay. So putting a lot of comments is a very uh, healthy habit to do when you're doing programming. Any questions? Tomorrow we will meet uh, in the computer room at 8 o'clock. And uh, what I will do is, you already have the assignment number 2. If you have questions on that, if you want to take a look at it, we can do that. In addition to that, I will bring, uh, I will post on Moodle uh, a set of MATLAB problems for you to just practice MATLAB. I'll be around to come and help individually if, uh, if you need help. So I'm not really going to lecture. Yeah. You know, sir? What, this one? Well, these functions are stored in your directory. So in my case, um, I'll show you where they are. So I have an assi a folder called assignment one. In the folder, I have uh, ASS01.m. That's an M file. Okay. Again, I'm not going to be able to run it under MATLAB, but maybe let me just edit it. There it is. Okay. So in MATLAB session, all I have to do is start MATLAB and then type ASS01. Then it will go into this file, execute all these commands, generate all the graphs. In fact, if you look at this one, I forgot to explain this one. What this is doing is these two are creating the plot. After the plot is created, it's printing a hard copy of the plot as a meta file. We can save it as a JPEG file, bitmap file, whatever you want. Into the file name. The file name here is called figure 6A. Okay. And then what I do is I run this in MATLAB, and then I copy this and paste it into a work file, copy the figures into the work file, and that's how I produce the solution that you see. That particular word file will contain, um, I mean, basically, I put the assignment that I gave you, which was the word. I put in the answers, and at the end of it, where I need to use MATLAB, I just cut and paste those scripts from that file. Okay? But to execute that file, you must have it as a separate file, and in MATLAB, you should type the name of the file. Okay? And in the same folder, you must also have other functions that this file calls. For example, for example this file calls A01H times 6A. So while executing it, that should that file should be there uh, in the folder. There it is, A01H times 6A, 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 6A. will just copies of the same program and just change that particular file. And then if you just type ASS01 in the MATLAB, it will produce all the graphs for it. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. 
I need a plumber. One assignment too, as well as a practice session in MATLAB where I will say create this matrix, do this matrix product, do this plot and things like that for you to go through it and try to understand what it is doing. Uh, so it will be a review of things from linear algebra. I don't know, have you done eigenvalue calculations and stuff? Right, but this is just how to use MATLAB. Yeah, give you, I ask you to construct a matrix and say calculate the eigenvalues. Later on, we'll be using and interpreting what eigenvalues are, how they uh, affect the stability and stuff like that. So I will prepare something like this, and you can work on it. And if you have, if you prefer to work on your assignment, that's fine too. You already have some questions at that time or get into difficulties, we will help individually. Okay. So I'll be there between eight and nine o'clock. It's completely voluntary. You can. This figure is already on the model as a solution file. Okay, just handle the assignment one, assignment solution will be there uh, in that week, the week that it will find it out. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Today is going to be without. I was going to show it in the lectures too. Unfortunately, that's not going to be possible. Okay, any questions so far on Laplace transform or anything that you have seen so far? So, in the last lecture, we saw how to solve, how to represent derivatives, Laplace transform of derivatives, and how to solve differential equations using Laplace transform. So we have seen that it can converts the problem into an algebraic domain, from a differential domain into an algebraic domain. Okay. So I'm going to show you three more examples, and each one has a particular unique feature of uh, the differential equation. And all these will tell us something about the nature of the dynamical system. Uh, the first example today is a third order differential equation. And you see the differential equation here with three initial conditions. The third order, is it linear or nonlinear? Why? You have to be careful. <laughs> it is right. If it is e to the power x, it will be nonlinear. So what you need to do is look for the unknown that you are solving, the dependent variable. And it should be nonlinear in that one. So this will be still a linear problem, but it will be called an unvarying problem because the right hand side is changing with time. You are forcing the system with time. So this is typically called a forcing function. And that forcing function in control will be the control action that you are implementing on the process. Okay. So x is a dependent variable and x appears without any nonlinearity in all these. Okay. So this is a linear problem. Remember Laplace transform works only for linear problems. Okay. So real problems in chemical engineering are always nonlinear. So we need to learn how to linearize nonlinear equations. That would be the next step, the uh, few chapters down. Okay. So for now, what we're going to do is solve this linear problem by Laplace transform, which means take the Laplace transform of the entire left-hand side and take the Laplace transform of the entire right-hand side. And because of linearity, you can kind of distribute this operator on each one of the terms and take the Laplace transform. So kind of color coded here. So the blue term, for example, is the third derivative. So the Laplace transform of the third derivative is s cubed times x of s. x is the unknown. So x now x of s means x is unknown in the Laplace domain. Okay, minus s squared times x of zero, which is the initial condition, minus s times x prime zero minus x double prime zero. So this entire term that you see here is the Laplace transform of the first term that you see there. Okay, and this continues. 
The next one is the Laplace transform of the second derivative. So I have two, two times the Laplace transform of the second derivative, which is s square x of s minus s x zero minus x prime zero. Okay. Minus the same thing for the third term, which is the first derivative, which is s of x s minus x zero. That's in brown. And then the last term is two of x. X itself is the unknown, so when you take the Laplace transform, we're going to get the simply the Laplace transform of X in F S domain. Equals on the right hand side you have four, which is such a constant. So it is as if it is four times one. One you know the Laplace transform is one over S. Okay. So this is the Laplace transform for the right hand side, the first term. And the next one is the Laplace transform of e to the power two t, which is one over S minus two. Okay. So once we have done this, we have transform the derivative into algebraic expression. Now we can separate the unknowns because this entire thing is an algebraic expression. We can solve for x of s. Once we see this done two or three times, we'll forget about this. Afterwards, we'll just deal directly in the Laplace domain. Okay. Uh, throughout the control course, we're going to be dealing basically with what is called a transfer function, which transfers input to the output. Here, the effect is this is the input on the system. The right hand side is the input on the system. That affects the output, and the output is x. Okay. So this entire thing, for example, can be written as b of x equals some function f. f is this forcing function here, and b is this derivative operator, the differential operator, which you can write as d cube dt cube plus 2 d squared dt squared minus b dt minus 2. Okay. This whole thing operating on x, I don't know whether you've seen it written this way, it is telling us that there is something about similarity between solving algebraic equations, and solving differential equations, and in Laplace transform way of forcing the transfer function. So this simply says this is equal to f, given an f, I need to find x such that when I operate x on this entire derivative operator, which is a combination of derivative operators, it should give me x. So the solution, finding solution simply means finding a back function x, which when I operate on this operator, gives me the f. Okay, that is the solution process. So what we are doing this, we are transforming this into the Laplace domain. So in the Laplace domain, what is the next step I do? I take all these initial conditions, x of 0, x of 0 is given to me in the problem as 1. Okay? So I substitute 1 here. So this becomes simply s squared. Okay? That term multiplied by 1. Then the next term is x prime of 0. x prime of 0 is 0. It drops out. The next term is x double prime. x double prime is minus 1. Okay? So I have minus of minus that becomes plus here. So this term is the same as that term. Okay. So all I'm doing is I'm substituting for each one of the known initial conditions, x0, x prime 0, x prime 0, x prime 0, and x prime 0. Okay. And then I'm collecting all the terms that are x of x. Okay. So now I'm collecting x of s here, x of s there, x of s there, x of s there. So that's unknown. Okay. So just algebraic rearrangement. So that tells me x of s multiplied by s cubed plus 2s squared minus s minus 2. Okay. So these are the various uh, these are the various terms that you're looking at. And then anything that is simply a function of s, like uh, this term, uh, this term, and this term. Okay. So they are combined together in here. And then you separate them. Solution simply means move everything to the right hand side, keep the unknown on the left hand side. That's your solution. Okay? So when you do that, you have been able to separate all the terms that multiply x of s, everything else to the right hand side, and then you divide by this term. So the final result is, after taking common factors and stuff, this is your solution. But the solution for x is in the Laplace domain. So what is the last step that you need to do? Invert it. Invert it to go back to time domain. Okay? Now this is not a trivial task. If I give you this Laplace transform at this date and say go back, what are the steps that you would need to do? 
get me the solution in the time domain. Partial fraction. You need to write this first, calculate this term, write it as a product of C term, and then use partial fraction. And I have given you all the steps in there. Okay. So I want you to go through that. Um, but if I can start MATLAB, it's one line that will give you the inverse. Because at Mat in MATLAB, you can throw any complicated expression. Okay. <laughs> okay. So in MATLAB, what you can do is just type I Laplace. And within parentheses, insert this entire expression as it is. Of course, you need to have symbols x at t. Define those as symbols, and then you can ex uh, write this expression as an argument to I Laplace. So you would start by saying s to the power 4 minus 6 multiplied by s squared plus 9 multiplied by s minus 8 with all the appropriate parentheses. Make sure that you don't make any mistake in typing it. But if you type the whole thing, that lab is going to give you the inverse of x in the time domain. Okay? So that's a fairly easy task to do in MATLAB. But if you're doing it by hand, what you need to do is the very first step. Take this expression, the cubic expression, factor it. Write it as x plus 1 times x plus 2 times x minus 1. Okay? And then you have now all factor terms in the denominator. So write them as uh, sum of a partial fraction. Okay? So the partial fraction step is to write this as equal to a over s plus b over s minus 2, which is the second term, plus c over s plus 1, which is the third term. So there are five terms. And you need to find out A, B, C, D, and E. Okay? And that's going to take you 20 minutes in an exam, right? To just to go through the steps. But I won't be asking you to do this in an exam. In an assignment, yes. You should have the skill to invert this one way or the other because when you go to a workplace, you will need that skill. Okay? But it is not necessary to do it by hand. These days, computers are available, so you should know how to use it. Um, Use it in a computer. Pretty soon you will have it in your handheld too, holding polygraph. <laughs> but what are we doing here? Once I did it as an expression, so I need to do it systematically. First, multiply everything by s. Okay. So the s will cancel, but here s will not cancel. Okay. Then it put s equal to zero. Okay, because this expression is valid for any s, I put s equal to zero to drop out all the terms containing b, c, and d. So I get only a. On the left-hand side, I have to put s equal to 1 into this entire expression and find out what is the value. That is going to be a. When you do that, you will find that a is equal to minus 8 over 4, which is minus 2. Minus 8 over 4 comes by substituting s equal to 0. For example, s equal to 0, all these drop out. Okay, so this is minus 8 you have. And then here, if you put s equal to 0, you get minus 2 times 1 times 2 times minus 1. So that gives you the minus 4. Okay? You need to follow the same procedure systematically for finding b, c, d, and e. Any questions on that? Okay? So to find b, for example, you get rid of s minus 2. So multiply everything by s minus 2. Okay? And then put s equal to 2. That will cancel all the other terms except b. Okay? And then you can get the value of b as 1 over 12. And I'm going to let you go through this. Just make sure that you understand. Get one of them, c, b, or e by yourself, and uh, convince yourself. Correct. Okay? And so finally, these are the values of a, b, c, and d. b and e, so you have except as a partial fraction in the Laplace domain. Now you can look at the table, the uh, table that I gave you earlier. Because these are all simple expressions for which the inverse is there already in the table. For example, 1 over x is simply 1. Inverse of 1 over x is simply 1. So the first term, when you invert it, it's minus 2. The second term, fourth and fifth term, they all have e to the power at. Okay? 
So A would be minus 2, uh, 1, 2, minus 1. Okay. So simply substituting those inverses, you will get uh, 1 over times e to the power 2t, uh, e to the power minus t here, again e to the power minus 2t, and e to the power t. Okay. That's how we get the solution in the Laplace class. From the plus to to the time limit. Any questions? It would be nice to see that MATLAB does this magically for you, but uh, try it. If not, to try it tomorrow in the class. Uh, the next case, I'm just just going to go through different cases. The reason for that is depending on these. Yeah, maybe I should point this out. You might have seen this in. Uh, a differential equation course, it is these factors minus Q1 that determine the nature of the solution. For example, is this solution going to be bounded as T goes to infinity? Bounded meaning not going to infinity. Yes, maybe. <laughs> What do you need for it to be bounded as t goes to infinity? What do you need for it to be remaining not going up to infinity? Goes to zero or flattens out, remains a constant. Neither one is possible. Now, if you take two, two alone, is, this is, remember, we can plot these each one individually. Okay, x versus t, one function at a time. So the first function is minus two, it's a constant. To that, I'm going to add the second function, which is 1 over times e to the power 2t. How does e to the power 2t go as t goes to infinity? Infinity, that is the problem. Okay? So when t equals to 0, it will be 1 over 12, the term. To start there, but it's going to go like this. This is your second term. This is your first term. How about the third term? The third term will start with when e to t is 0, e to the 0 is 1, so it will start somewhere at 11 over 3, but then it's going to decay. Okay? So each one of these terms has a different character. Okay? One blows up, the other one decays. But the net solution is the sum of all this. So what is that going to do, the sum of all this? Blow up. Right? Because all these are going to, the negative ones are going to go to 0, but the positive ones are going to explode. Okay? So this would be an unstable system in a control system. If this were a true model for a reactor, you can expect the reactor to blow up. That's how it blows up. Right? So a lot of accidents in chemical uh, companies occur because of this so-called runaway reaction. Exothermic reaction, cooling fails, for example, so it produces more heat, it speeds up the reaction even more, and just fires. Okay? That's what happens. So unstable systems are characterized by having positive eigenvalues. These are called eigenvalues. The factors that multiply t, they are called eigenvalues. Okay? So positive eigenvalues is something that we don't want in the system. We want them all to be in the negative part of the domain. So these are okay. Now in this particular problem, if you look at the problem, you will see where the problem is originating. You have e to the power 2t. That is forcing the system to blow to zero. So it's as if you are handling energy continuously, forcefully from external things. In most systems, that wouldn't happen. The forcing will be bounded. So the real way to ask the question of stability is when I have a bounded input, bounded forcing, does the system produce bounded output? Okay? Then we have an inherently stable system. But sometimes when we are putting a control action by tuning the controller, we can move it into an unstable region. So we need to be aware when a controller action can move that operation into an unstable domain and avoid that. So these are the issues that we are going to deal with later on in control system design. So we are kind of preparing ourselves to address all these things. Any questions? Okay, so the second type of behavior is when the roots are complex. Okay, so here I have a different differential equation. Is this linear or nonlinear? It's linear. Is the forcing bounded or unbounded? The forcing is bounded. On the right hand side, we don't have anything exploring. Okay? So this should behave very well, hopefully, right? 
So we'll see what it is. Uh, and the initial conditions are zero. Okay. The procedure is exactly the same, but you will get into a problem when you're trying to solve for the roots. Okay. So the first step is take the second derivative and replace it in the Laplace domain. Then take the first derivative and replace it with its Laplace transform. And take the third term and replace it by its Laplace transform. Okay. And the other side, I have an error. What is the error? It's a type four over here. It should be two over n. Thank you. Okay, I just thought it said now. The next step is fine. Sometimes I do current things that my guess it changes. Okay. So the next step is input the initial condition. So this is zero in this case, this is zero, and this is zero. Initial conditions are simple. So what you get is x of s times s square, which is this term, and then 2s, which is this term, and then 2, which is this term. So it's easy to solve. Okay. So x of s, the solution in the Laplace domain, is simply 2 divided by s uh, times s squared plus 2s plus 2. Am I going fast? Because I have prepared the notes, I'm kind of <laughs> Just talking about it instead of writing. If I write it, obviously, it will be slower. Are you able to keep up with it? Looking at it, and now the question is: If you have to factor this term, what are you going to do? Or if you are going to solve for the roots, it's a quadratic equation. So you can solve for the roots, right? That I do expect. If it is a quadratic equation, you should be able to solve it. Okay, anything beyond that, I don't expect you to be able to do it. So a quadratic equation, if you solve it, you'll find the roots are minus 1 minus j, minus 1 plus j. So we get a complex root. When do we get a complex root? Why do we get a complex root? Whenever you have the square root of minus something. Okay? So for the quadratic equation here, for example, if you're solving this, it's going to be minus 2 plus or minus square root of 4 minus uh, 4 times 2 divided by 2. So here you have four times four minus eight. So you have minus four, square root of minus four. That's the one that gives you the complex root. Okay? So there is a pair of complex roots, minus one minus j, minus one plus j. The solution is still going to be given by something like e to the power minus one minus j p plus another term, which will be e to the power minus one plus j p. Right? So uh, let me just go through the partial fractions first, and then we'll come back to the type of solution. So this is the factor term. So in MATLAB, you can directly go and put a complex term in I Laplace. It'll work. MATLAB handles complex numbers very naturally. If they occur automatically, it'll switch to complex arithmetic automatically for you. Okay. And if you input a complex expression, uh, MATLAB will invert that. But the symbol for complex expression in MATLAB is i, not j. Okay? So if you are representing i, like there are some numbers that are uh, inherently defined within MATLAB. One is i. For example, you can type i. You know its value as 3.1415 or whatever. Okay? So you can have terms like 2 times i easily. It's a built-in variable. So the same way i is a built-in variable, it simply stands for square root of minus 1. Okay. So you can do things like i squared or i times i. Okay. It will do the product for you. Okay. So you can take this entire expression and pass it to i Laplace if you so choose. Okay. Pass this one and it will inverse and it will give you the result that you will see at the bottom of this analysis. But what I'm showing you here is how do I do the partial fraction in the complex domain? That idea is the same. So you're going to write this as a factor of a over s plus b over the second term, which is s plus 1 plus j, plus c over the third term, which is s plus 1 minus j. And then you're going to multiply by s, put s equal to 0 to evaluate what a is. Okay? So that process of evaluating the constants would be the same uh, multiplied by, for example, s uh, minus uh, plus 1 plus j 
and then put s equal to minus 1 minus j to cancel that term. Okay. So whatever you are doing in the real arithmetic, you are going to do in the complex arithmetic. You cancel one term at a time. And you will find b to be a number. It could be a complex number. So in this case, b turns out to be minus 1 minus j over 2. And similarly, I want you to show, just work for your thought, that c is minus 1 plus j over 2. So if you have any of you, if, I'm, if you think I'm going fast, if you need explanations of this, please just drop my office. I go through this usually in greater detail. Okay? But it's just a routine uh, algebraic manipulation. So what you get finally is x of s in the factor form one term plus the next term plus the next term. So you can invert each one of them individually. And when you invert that, this you can do by table lookup. Okay? So in the table lookup, you're going to get the first term is simply 1. The second term is minus 1 minus j over 2, which is a constant, a complex constant, multiplied by e to the power, this term, which is minus a 1 plus jt. So now we say the eigenvalue, the eigenvalue here is minus 1 minus j. Eigenvalue is the thing, the time constant, we call the time constant. Okay. It's the thing that multiplies t. Okay. So in this case, the eigenvalue is complex. Okay. So how do you express something like this? For example, e to the power a plus j, b times t. a and b are constant. This is now I'm asking you to recall what you learned in complex areas. Okay. This is nothing but e to the power a, 1 minus e to the power j, b, t. This is all wrong. Right? So just that needs to be in the And then e to the power a, t remains as e to the power a, t. But e to the power j, b, t, j being a complex number, is some, there's something called the more there. I don't know if you remember that which is the Morbius theorem. It's a relationship which simply says that e to the power i theta is equal to cos theta plus i sine theta. So a relationship between the trigonometric representation and the The reason I'm recalling this is this tells you something about the dynamical behavior. How does the solution behave? Okay. So using that, <coughs> I can write the solution as a little bit more algebraic manipulation. Again, please go through that. If you have questions, come and see me. So I'm taking this form of the result and rewriting it in this form by substituting e to the power j b t in terms of cos b t plus j sin b t. And this is my solution. Now the question that I'm asking you to interpret, this is where you need to develop the feeling for how the solution is going to be. Is it bounded or not? As p goes to infinity, what happens to x of t? x of t goes to 1. Okay, because the second term will drop out. This will drop out. This will drop out. So it will go to 1. Okay? So the solution is going to 1. But how does it go to 1? Does it go monotonically or does it go in an oscillatory fashion? What does the sine function do? How does the sine function look like? The problem is sine of t alone. Sine of t versus t. It's going to be something like this. Forever, right? just oscillates back and forth. So here I have sine of t and cosine of t, so it's going to be some sort of an oscillation. If I didn't add e to the power minus t, that oscillation will stay forever as t goes to infinity. Because sine is bounded between minus 1 and plus 1, no matter how, how large t is. Okay? But because I'm multiplying by, this term multiplies by an exponentially decaying solution, the real response of the system is going to be something like this, if you want to plot. Again, I was going to plot this for you because the picture is always worth a thousand words, but my plan is not cooperating to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, 
So uh, this is going to look something like this. Remember, we started with zero initially. Okay? So the solution is going to be something like this. Okay? After zero, oscillate, but a decaying oscillation, eventually reaching the value of one. That's how the dynamic response of this particular system is going to look like. Okay? Any questions? X sub T is the solution to some problem. Now we have not given a physical meaning to this particular problem. We have said that this is just a second order equation governed by this particular problem. Okay. This is a problem that we started off with. Now this could come from a tank, a draining tank which you are heating, which is the second order equation. You have two equations there. Okay. So this could represent that particular model, or it could represent an RC circuit in electrical engineering. It could represent uh, what you call a viscous damping problem in mechanical engineering. Okay. So you have uh, what you call a dash part and uh, a spring connected to a map. If you write down the mechanical valve force that is the equation that we put any on that, you have a mass and you are applying a certain force, okay? And this spring, of course, will resist that force, but there is a viscous damping here that will also resist the force. So if you are trying to describe the motion of this ball in such an environment, the typical model is a door stopper. Most of the dampers on the door, when you open a door, it gently goes back, right? So there is a damper there, there's a spring that brings it back. Okay. If you want to look at the dynamics of such a door, for example, it will be described by a second order equation of this type. So in this particular case, your question is what is X represent? If that is a model, X could represent the swinging. Okay. If it is a tank, it could represent the temperature oscillation. Or if it is an RC circuit, it could represent the passive and voltage current, things like that. For a mathematician, this is a second order equation. It doesn't matter where it comes from, it has the same properties. Right? For engineers, that is important. Without it, I'm sure the differential equation causes struggle with this. Why am I doing this? Why am I going to find application for it? Right? This is where you're going to find application for it. Hopefully, it'll sink in once we relate that to the physics. Okay? So, for, for now, I'm just recalling what you have done and re equipping you with the tool because we need those tools to the power. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the first problem or the current problem? Okay. Yeah, so let's, okay. Uh, let's do this. Okay, so I multiply by 10. Okay, and put s equal to 0. That drop, clearly this term drops out. B and C term will drop out because they get multiplied by s, s remains. But in the first term, s cancels out. So I get only 1. Okay. So from the three terms, I have picked only one term by this careful multiplication by the appropriate denominator. In this case, it's s. Now then, I need to do the same thing on the right hand side. On the right hand side, I have 2 divided by s times s plus 1 plus j multiplied by s plus 1 minus j. And I multiply this by s also. I have to multiply every term in the equation by s. So I did. On the right hand side, now I'm multiplying this term, and so the s cancels out. And now I need to put s is equal to uh, 0. Right? So when I put s equal to 0, I'm going to get 2 divided by this is 0. So I'm going to get 1 plus j times 1 minus j. Okay? So that should be equal to 8. Okay? Now what is 1 plus j times 1 minus j? It is 1 minus j squared. Right? And j squared is minus 1. Right? So this is going to be equal to 2 divided by 
1 minus j square, which would be equal to 2 divided by 1 plus 1, which would be equal to 2 divided by 2, should be equal to 1. Okay? So, did I put 2 somewhere else? If I did, that would be a mistake. No, that's 1. Okay? So, that's two. That's the process you need to do for the other ones too. Okay, simply if I digitalize it, it will take you 15 20 minutes in an exam. And this is not my intent to test, but you need to know this, how to do it. I would ideally like to have the exam in the math lab session so that you can go through these and focus on the real part of this course, which would be to design the control and to understand the dynamics of it. So what I'm talking about in terms of the nature of the solution, these are important in this course. It's to understand the dynamics. What will the response look like? How can I control the response? Okay, so we will talk more about this as we go along. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do one thing because we are running out of time. There is one more case, that is the case of repeated root. Okay, and this is this example. I'm not going to cover this in the next class. I'm going to ask you to read it on your own so that we move on to the next uh, topic, the next chapter. Okay, go through this. If you have any questions, please drop by and ask. But you are responsible to know. What is a repeated group? Do you know what a repeated rule is? When you go through a Laplace transform and you get a term like this, you are factoring it. When you factor it, you get a term like this, which is s plus 1 cube, which means s plus 1 times s plus 1 times s plus 1. So that eigenvalue of 1 occurs three times. That is what we call repeated group. And that affects the dynamics. We'll, we will talk about the consequence of this in the next class. And I'm going to avoid the algebraic manipulation and doing the partial fractions and getting the solution. Okay? I'm going to talk about the nature of the solution in the next class. I'm going to pick up from there. So please go through that example on your own. And please do tell me if I'm going fast. Okay? All right. Any questions? I do have that. Uh, it is written out. Okay. How to do the partial fractions is written out there. So go through it. If you have questions, please come back. Okay. So tomorrow at 8 o'clock, a voluntary session, and then we'll meet uh, on Friday.